Welcome to the T2 Hubcast. Join Martin, Dave, Spencer and guests as they discuss all things personal and professional development. The T2 Hubcast, brought to you by the People Performance People. So welcome to the T2 Hubcast with me, Martin Johnson. And me, Spencer Locker. Spencer. We're back. We've soundproofed it, proofed our hubcast room. Yes. So we're hoping that the um, the sound might be a bit more crisp on this one. So let's uh, see how it goes. Yeah. But it's good to be back. And um, we're fresh off the back of a series of workshops that we've just agreed with a client after running a pilot um, to support one of their quality campaigns in the organization. This is a manufacturer. Uh, they, they want to drive the messaging around quality going forward. So we've agreed a series of cultural and people-focused workshops to really, um, you know, drive home some salient points around what is the human element of quality, of driving quality in organizations. And it just got us thinking, Spence, we wanted to record a podcast on it because I think it's really interesting and I think it's relevant for a lot of organizations out there. Um, and, you know, we also started to look at the ISO eight standards or eight principles of quality. So we're going to link that in in this podcast and we're just going to have a good chat about how we're approaching it and what we'd advise organisations out there to consider if they want to improve quality. Yeah. Um, Just this, uh, (laughs) it's quite interesting because the the quality aspects that we've been looking at for years now, years, um, actually line up really well with the ISO standards and... uh, it's, uh, it's it's quite good. Well, I say it's quite good. I'm not saying it's coincidence. However, uh, it just goes to show that um, it all knits together. It all marries up quite well. Yeah, and and just to sort of build upon what Spencer's saying there, and we'll go through them in a second. But the ISO, uh, the International Organization for Standardization, of course, have, have have released sort of eight principles of quality that organizations should really follow or should should consider when trying to improve processes, uh, you know, uh, outputs, uh, the, the quality of what they do. Um, and it's quite a universally well-known thing, but when it's all right knowing the eight principles, but you've still got to be able as a leadership team to drive them to fruition. You've still got to be able to execute them in the organization. And not only that, but you've got to be able to um, bring people together and have the collective group of people adhere to them as well. So how do you do that? And that's where our work comes in. That's where we work with organizations around, you know, how do you actually drive this from a leadership perspective? So just to, to start off, Spence, the eight principles of quality in accordance with ISO is this. Number one, customer focus. You know, number two, leadership. Leadership is really important. Number three, involvement of the people. We've just talked about that. You can't just do it in isolation or as a leadership team. You've got to involve your people. Number four, of course, as well as the people element, you've got process. So the approach with processes. Number five, systems approach to management. So as well as people and process, we talk about technology. You've got to have your systems in place. Number six, continuous improvement. And that's maintaining that focus on continually um looking at how you do things and how it can be improved. Number seven, factual approach to decision-making. This is an interesting one because a lot of people in organizations make decisions based on gut feeling or on emotion, right? We have to, with quality, let's stick to the facts. Let's have some rationale and logic behind the decisions that we make. And number eight, mutually beneficial supplier relationships. Of course, no organization delivers to their customer in isolation. Most organizations have partners, suppliers, and their relationships with those people are essential to be able to deliver quality. So they're the eight principles according to ISO. However, knowing this is one thing. Putting it into practice and ensuring that your organization is delivering quality is a completely different thing. Um, And that is because it's the, in my opinion, Spence, and I'll get yours, it's the leadership team's ability to galvanize a group of people to execute upon those eight things that matters, right? Certainly. Uh, the amount of times that we've actually uh, worked with an, worked with organizations, uh, whether they be uh, public or private, 
um, we found that as much as uh, a, a lot of them are aware of these um, standards, these principles of quality, uh, whether they're the ISO principles of quality or whether they're um, sort of variations thereof that we come along, uh, we do find that, um, yeah, there's awareness. Awareness is one thing. Actually putting them into practice is something else. Uh, and we found that uh, with some of the organisations that do require a lot of input from us, they seem to be, um, how shall we put this? It's like the revision. It's like revising for an exam. When you're revising for an exam, it's human nature to focus on the stuff you already know. So out of, let's say for the sake of argument, out of those eight principles, you probably, let's say you're doing four or five of them. The other three let's say, um, are maybe something you're not doing, but you'll focus on the stuff that you're doing really well and sort of conveniently forget the other ones. Yeah. Um, and really, those other ones are the ones that you should be focusing on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing as well is that organisations will will put, will put plaster these eight principles on their wall or they'll distribute some paraphernalia around, uh, you know, here's the eight principles and this is as an organisation what we expect everybody to adhere to and to, to execute upon. But then there's very little accountability or action that comes on the back of that. So yeah. you're not really improving any of the eight. Um, and that's one of the frustrating things. And, and and so what we do here at T2 is when we work with our customers on, on everything, we always come at it from the people element, the human element, the cultural element of getting things done, whether that's leadership, whether that's sales, whether that's development, whatever it might be. But with quality, uh, this is where I think it makes a real difference because uh, most sessions, workshops, or training on quality will follow the eight principles and they'll be very transactional and very uh, transmitting uh, in terms of just a training session where they'll go through these things. You'll get frameworks, you'll get all of this stuff, the five S's in manufacturing and all that type of stuff. And it's fantastic and it's great and it gives you a framework and a methodology to to, to, uh, you know, to follow. However, what we do is we we come at it from a slightly different approach. And I want to talk, Spencer, about a particular um, activity that we run, an interactive activity that always just opens people's eyes to, to the key um, you know, principles of, of, of knitting these eight together. And you've got to be really careful here because <laughs> if somebody's listening to this and they've got this to come, you don't want to give it away. Exactly. So I won't. But what, what we do is we, we look at a, um, an activity where – for me, if you're going to learn how to um, to spot the gaps in in quality and, and how teams work together, you've got to put them live in a scenario where they have to solve an issue or deliver quality and watch them fail miserably. And therefore, you can then pick apart the things that they didn't do, which sacrificed on the eight principles in accordance with ISO. So it, it's it's a really fun way of doing it. It's an interactive way of doing it, but it's it just unfolds in front of you. And actually, when you then feed back and say, well, you didn't do X, Y, and Z, and this is where it all fell down, they can relate that back to actually things in the workplace that happen on a daily basis. And that's the way we work with teams to drive quality. So we do a particular activity called navigation, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. <laughs> But it's a team of five people who have to solve a task in five minutes. They've all got a different role. They can only follow the instruction that is given. And the aim is they have to get it right first time. Quality, right? If they don't get it right first time, they can still continue with the task. They can have as many goals as they like. But every time they start again or the activity restarts, the quality goes down and down and down until the actual visual representation at the end of the five minutes is even for those who made it to the end and completed the task, look at the state of it, right? Look at what you've ended up with. <laughs> Whereas those who get it right first time through quality, through doing the right things to deliver upon, upon the eight principles, theirs looks neat, tidy, and absolutely they've nailed it. And it's, it's such a great visual representation of how you do it. Now, I'm not going to say any more on the, the activity and task because many of, of our customers run this with us and we don't want to spoil it for anybody, but... What I want to come on to, Spence, is a couple of the learning outcomes and the things that we're trying to uncover to be able to say this is where quality falls down from a human element, from a group element. Sure. So let's start off with the the, the obvious one, um, which 
it's not just around quality, it's around anything in any organization, but it's communication. Communication between human beings, between teams, on any of those eight principles is absolutely key. And when we talk about communication, Spence, we're talking about not just giving communication, we're talking about receiving communication, yeah. which is a big one. It is. Everybody big. likes to transmit, right? Yeah. Uh, it's So many people, when, when we start talking about communication, it's both in sending and receiving information. People seem to think that communication is just sending information. Uh, but as you, as you rightly said, it's both ways. It's how it's received, how it's interpreted, and then the action that follows as a result of that. Um, and then there's a, cause there's a great video on YouTube, isn't the Spence? Have you ever seen it about the, um, there's a big line of, of all the employees are outside and they form a big line and they're all facing in the same direction behind each other. So they can't see the person in front of them or, the, or behind, or they can see the people in front, but not behind. And anyway, it starts at the end of the conga line. Hmm. So one person gets tapped on the shoulder, they turn around and then somebody does, uh, um, uh, acts out uh, a, a thing, mm. right? And and the in this particular video, it's it's the the simulate kickstarting a motorbike. So the person sort of kicks it off with the leg, turns the throttle with the hand, and you can see visibly that they're kickstarting a motorbike. So then the next person has to observe that without saying anything. Turn around, tap the next person on the shoulder, and do the same thing. So it's like Chinese whispers all the way down. Um, but you can't say a word. It's just the visual representation. And it's an amazing experiment because it starts off pretty well, but every single time it's passed on, a little bit of minutia changes. And then you get to the end and it's a completely different action. It's like gone from kickstarting a motorbike to, I can't remember what it ends up being <laughs> like, right? But the point being is that communication, the way it's given and received is incredible and interpreted is important in quality because it only takes the passing of that communication to go down four or five communication lines and it can come out the other end in a completely different way. And that's when we start to have issues. <clears throat> so, you know, listening to the others with the intent to understand is really important when it comes to quality. You know, speaking with clarity and agreeing objectives, agreeing, not just directing, you know, that's the really important part. The other thing is don't interrupt others while they're talking. We talked about it on the last podcast. Yeah, microaggressions. Yeah, just just don't wait for your turn to talk and then come in. I, I'm guilty of this sometimes. My brain works out 100 miles an hour, so I'm like, you say something. I'm like, right, that's really good, and I've got something to say. <laughs> um, replay back information for understanding, and I think this is a really important one. Those Chinese whispers and that, evolution of changing what was initially communicated doesn't happen if we if we check and, and clarify for understanding at every point and all, always focus on what you want to achieve and what needs to be done rather than on what we need to avoid or must not do that's so important in quality mm. so when that's that's all challenge state challenge state communication isn't it and we talk about that to to a to a great length on, on, on almost everything we do certainly so the second um Second key thing we try and uncover in the exercise we run, Spence, in terms of to deliver quality is, is, I think it's the most important one. I think it's where quality uh, falls off a cliff in, in organizations. It ties into closed loop thinking and being devoid of accountability, but it is accountability and ownership. Why, for you, Spence, why do you think accountability and ownership, and what we mean by this, Spence, is Everybody's got a part to play in an organization or in a team. And everybody's therefore accountable to deliver some aspect of it, whether it's technology process, sales, aftercare, uh, whether you design the product, whether you make the product, whatever it is, you've all got a part to play. You've all got a piece of the pie. If somebody or some link in that chain is not accountable and truly owns their area, Quality falls off a cliff. Yeah. Give me an exact, just just talk to me in your opinion why that is and why we really try and focus on hammering home the accountability aspect of quality. Well, it's, <clears throat> it again, it's it's like some, we, as we say with different people, it, it means different things to different people, but they're not a million miles apart. Some people, it's all about trust. Uh, when we start talking about trust, we talk about trust-based leadership, possibly. We're talking about trusting peers. But it's like when you say 
do what you will first time every time and stick into the plan, then people will trust you and people will have faith in you. Um, be clear on what you own and what you don't own. So are we, are we saying stay in your lane? Stay in your lane. So, yeah, it's like if I'm going to be accountable for something, um, I need to be clear on what it is I'm accountable for. I need to be fully on board with that and accept that, right? Um, but I also need to be clear on what I'm not accountable for because if I start meddling in your area, which often happens in organizations, if I start uh, getting frustrated and meddling in your area, that causes friction, that causes conflict. We then have siloed behavior and us a new mentality <clears throat> and quality starts to very quickly go downhill. So account as much as being accountable for what you own and what you need to be responsible for, really be clear on what you're not accountable for. And that helps you have a complete clarity over, you, you know, your contribution. Yeah. You know what your what what's in your lane and what's not in your lane. Yeah. And it doesn't mean, Spence, that <clears throat> in great teams you can't contribute to other people's areas. Certainly. But there's a difference between contribution and accountability. Yes. Very right? much so. Yeah. Um, seeing a task through even when it's providing a ch uh, proving a challenge. So, yeah, it's, it's when we start talking about things that are worth doing, when we start looking back on our lives and our professional lives and our personal lives, we remember the achievements that we do, we make. Usually it's the ones that have been most challenging. The ones yeah. that are easy, <laughs> we just do sort of, we, 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 we do automatically. But it's those challenging ones that we don't give up. We force through that challenge and, and we achieve what we need to achieve. Any, the, the old saying of anything worth having takes time and effort and it's difficult, right? Anything yeah. that's worth, you know, that gives you that self-fulfillment at the end of it isn't easy. So, you know, being accountable for your area is one thing. Seeing the task through, and no matter what the circumstances, will always end up, you know, in, in your ability to try and deliver the outcome or the quality that you need, yeah. And never conceal mistakes. Have the confidence to air issues and problems. Now, I, I mean, it's not something new to us, but um, one thing that I remember from when Foxy did our uh, T2 Talks, one of the things that he said, he calls it having grown up conversations, is actually when you're having your hot debrief after something's after a, a, a you've, you've had a pro, you've done a project or or, or a, uh, you've produced something for a customer, you sit down. What went right? What didn't go right? Yeah, uh, and people are actually turning around saying, you know what, I did this. I could have done it better. If I'd have done it this way, we may have achieved a better higher quality or may have been able to. But it's basically standing up and going, that will me that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and that's really important because it provides, we just discussed it yesterday, Spence, you know, the ability to not conceal mistakes in a team and have the confidence to where problems and issues, it does drive accountability and ownership, but it also provides psychological safety. So it says, listen, we're all committed to doing the best job we can and we're all committed to quality. But if organizations go about it in the wrong way and they overly focus on reprimanding mistakes and that we must not mess up, then people are going to conceal mistakes and they won't have the confidence to air issues and problems. And then quality will never be fixed. Yeah. So <clears throat> we've got to, this all ties in together, but having psychological safety to be able to go, I understand that quality is important, but I also understand that we have been given a license and, and, and approval to be able to come forward with mistakes and issues so we can fix them and resolve problems. So therefore we can uphold quality. And that's that's sometimes a thing that really, really harms organizations when they've got a culture where people don't have psychological safety. Mm, yeah. Okay, so 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 that's we've talked about communication and we've talked about the importance of accountability and ownership. You mentioned a word right at the start of there, which is the third learning outcome of our activity that we run, yeah. which is which is trust. Um, and you also mentioned stay in your lane. Yeah. So when we talk about trust, we're talking about stay in your lane as much as you can and trust your colleagues to stay in there. So as member, as well as being aware of what you're accountable for and what you're not, you've got to trust others to do their job. And if they're, and if things aren't going well, you've got to trust them that they'll resolve it and vice versa. Trust is really, really important. We talk about it in leadership, but when we truly trust people, we we generally have cohesive um, teams because we have high degrees of rapport. We respect their credibility. We've, we know we can rely upon them. 
and then things start to happen more fluidly without a shadow shadow of a doubt. The second aspect of trust is always speak about others as if they were in the room. Now, this is Mm. an age-old saying, but it's so true because nothing will sabotage cohesion and teamwork than a lack of trust because you've heard secondhand what somebody said about you in that meeting or somebody threw you under the bus on that conference call on Friday. And then all of a sudden we've got a political nightmare. Yeah. Because all of a sudden now we're all trying to achieve the same outcome. We all have a responsibility to deliver against this same outcome. But now I don't like you and I'm not going to work collaboratively. collaboratively. And actually it goes as far in organizations where they go, I actually want you to fail. I know that's candid, but it, it's true. Mm-hmm. If 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 people start speaking ill of other people when they are not present, the trust goes, and actually then I want you to fall on your ass, but by the nature of you falling on your ass, I fall on mine. Does that make sense? So trust is so important. Avoiding, avoid blaming others for failure. Remain focused on the resolution. Great teams do this, Spence. Foxy talked about it in the debrief, didn't they? The hot debrief. Yes, things have gone wrong. Yes, that mission went wrong. Yes, we, we you know, let's dissect it but with the focus on what we can do better next time rather than your shit, you've done that wrong, it's yeah. your fault, and then yeah. we've got a, a toxic environment. Yeah, a well, toxic environment. And again, as you were saying uh, earlier on, uh, it's that, um, what did we, what we were talking about yesterday, you just mentioned Psychological it. safety. Psych- psychological safety. So if you're, if you're in a blame culture and somebody starts pointing the finger or they, they're not taking accountability, they're not taking responsibility for their mess up, oh, I, will, I would have done it if it weren't for them, if they hadn't done this, they hadn't done that. So again, you're not going to trust each other. You're not going to, people aren't going to speak up. People aren't going to turn around and say, I've got an idea because they think, well, if that idea fails, then I'm going to get the blame for it. So it's better for me to... And this is why it all ties in, you know, com- poor communication of speaking about others behind their back mm. results in the trust going, which then results in, the, in jeopardizing the accountability. Mm. You know, people have become devoid of accountability because they hide behind the fact that say, well, we can't deliver upon what we need to deliver on because of that person or because of this area or that division or whatever it might mm. be. And then it all starts to crumple and fall in. You know, last one on trust for me before we come on to the last part is, you know, um, work on becoming reliable because reliability is the most influential factor in trust-based relationships. We have the trust-based leadership equation here at T2 where having surveyed thousands of people, we know that reliability is one of the main ingredients of trust. If I can't rely upon you or you let me down time and time again, I can't trust you. And when I can't trust you, we're not going to work well together, right? So, um Become reliable, no matter how busy you are, no matter how complex the situation, do what you say you will do. Uh, It is the most influential factor on trust. The final one is one that, um, so so we've talked, just just to recap, we've talked about how do you deliver upon the eight principles of ISO. Well, communication, number one. Number two, accountability and ownership. Number three, trust. Number four would not be expected, or I think by a lot of organizations, it's not one that it stands out like the other three, but it's when we explain it, I think it's really, really important. Uh, and number four is composure. Now, composure is, it, there's a, a different ways to describe composure. You can be calm, you know, that, you know, those people who are like ice cool under pressure. And I think composure the best way to describe it is when you're under pressure. So how a human being will act or react in a pressurized situation. That is the, that's the ultimate descriptor of composure for me. Yeah. Um, Because there is nothing more reassuring than someone who can remain calm under pressure. Would you agree, Spence? I would. I would certainly. Um, We, we see um, in many of the, many of the, uh, Unconscious motivators that we reveal, uh, certain unconscious motivators li- lend themselves really well uh, to this on, on the surface. Um, but it's not just a case of, well, I'm not an eight, so I'm not good under, uh, I'm not composed or under pressure. People are, it's just, it looks different to different people. Um, the most obvious will be uh, your eight when everybody else is losing their head and then eight turns around and goes, here, hold me beer, I've got this. 
That's yeah. their natural yeah. time to and, shine. And for anybody it? who's not familiar <clears throat> what Spencer's talking about, we we deliver a unconscious motivators training, and it's funny because we just assume everybody yeah. knows what yeah. we're talking about. Spencer's talking about an eight, which is a particular. They're all numbered one to nine, which is a particular unconscious motivator that does well under pressure. Yeah, it's the leader amongst the people. It's the one who thrives and rises to the top, and you know, shoulders the burden of of making the decision under pressure. Um, but you're right. There are certain people, Spencer, who are programmed and wired to be more composed under pressure. And there are certain people who are not. It doesn't mean that every human being can't, you know, practice composure and develop the skill set to be more composed. Mm. Some will naturally uh, be better at this than others. But you know, one of the one of the key things that the Royal Marines have in their in their values is is uh, cheer, cheerfulness in adversity. So, so I think this is a big one uh, in organisations. You know, remain to remain cheerful in adversity, it will absolutely maintain the morale and the togetherness. So, it's the old adage of if you if you if you don't laugh, you'll cry, right? If you can't laugh at a situation, you'll cry. When all's going wrong, you know, let's say you're in manufacturing and everything's breaking down, you're not getting the quality of the product out the end of the line, you're behind on customer commitments. You know, the the production directors are shouting and screaming. It's all people are then rushing and making more mistakes. It's all going wrong. If you can't laugh, you'll cry. It's really important under composure to remain cheerful in adversity. I'm not saying that you don't take it seriously. I'm saying that the minute it becomes overly serious and angst and and strict and rigid and you know everybody tenses up and that sacrifice the quality will very quickly go downhill. In, in terms of the the last bit, I want to throw in the pot. Um, I think this is a saying, Spence, that any organisation listening to this who has a focus on quality um, will will resonate with or have said in the past, and that is under composure. I think this is a key one. Getting something done properly is more important than getting something done. You know, when we're under pressure. Those without composure will tend to say things like, just get it done. I know this is going to sacrifice on whatever it is, and I know it's not going to be perfect. Just get it done. Customer's going to be here on Friday, or it needs to go off, go, go out on the wagon tomorrow, right? Just get it done. And when we're commercially thinking as an organization, it's easy to get trapped in that. But what we're saying here is those who are composed would rather delay the customer delivery and get it done properly than just get it done. Quality. Yeah. And that's quality in a nutshell. Yeah. And uh, I think that the, there may be people listening to this um, who are uh, emotionally intelligent uh, and self-aware, and they may sort of think to themselves, yeah, that's not me. I, uh, I do tend to uh, lose my composure a little bit. <clears throat> excuse me, lose my composure a little bit um, when things are going to the wall. So I'll strike that off. That's not me. Well, I'll ch- I'd will i like to challenge that because what you'll find is that if you sort communication out, if you're good with the accountability and the ownership, and if you trust the people you're working with, you will be composed yeah. because you've got the communication. You communicate effectively. Accountability and ownership, you know what you are responsible for and what you are not responsible for. And you trust the people around you to do what they've got to do. That makes you composed. Yeah. So f- consider what is it that's not making you composed. If you are not a naturally composed person, uh, you find that you're losing it in certain pressurized situations. Why? Are you communicating effectively? Have you got accountability and ownership clear and unambiguous? And do you trust the people you're with? Absolutely. What's then, the missing link? Yeah. What's the missing link that's not? And it's still not going to make you, you know, uh, ice man, you know, or, or you know, Mister or Mrs. Cool, <laughs> but but it's going to make you more composed. You've yeah. got a fighting chance of of being more composed as a team if the other in- ingredients are all there. You're absolutely right. So I think that's a perfect sort of wrap up, Spence. And just with a minute left, I think. You know, if you've listened to this podcast and 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 you're trying to drive improvements around quality in your organisation, think about uh, the way you can bring the key principles alive. It's not just about di- distributing leaflets and posters and you know and and documentation around ISOs, eight principles, and it's not just about having the five S's in manufacturing. It's not just about having all of these frameworks and and checklists, etc. 
the human cultural element, the team element of quality is incredibly important. And we've discussed four things on here, communication, accountability and ownership, trust and composure. And as I say, the activity we run really exposes these four elements, but it's the best learning that teams can do to be able to understand what they're missing and what's important. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that, Spence. Maybe we'll come back and do another another bit on quality because there's so much more to cover. But I, I think for now that'll do. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Spence. No, thank you. And uh, we'll be back shortly with another T2 Hubcast. 